Hello, sweetheart. Where are all these people? Come say hello. 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 I'm Stella Morris. I am Julian Assange's partner. I met him in 2011. We got together in 2015. And we have two children, Max and Gabriel. I had received an email from Jennifer Robinson, who put out a request through her Oxford network that her, the case that she was involved in, which involved Julian Assange, needed more people. Our first meeting was in Paddington at the Frontline Club. Uh, I was um, scheduled to be at an interview. I didn't know who I was going to meet. I rang the doorbell and went up the stairs and he was sitting alone at a table, which really um, came as a surprise because at the time he was, he was already a um, world famous uh, figure and he asked me who I was and I said I had come for an interview and he thought he thought I was an American journalist who was there to interview him so he immediately was quite guarded and who was this woman who had just walked into the room and I said no no I'm here I'm here to be interviewed which immediately relaxed him and uh, he offered me the tea he was drinking and then other people came in and I talked about my background, the fact that I was a fluent Swedish speaker, the fact that I had studied law and started working with Baltasar Garson, um, who was the international coordinator of of Julian's international legal team. In 2012, he took political asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy. Just like my language skills in Swedish had been relevant uh, for the Swedish case, uh, my Spanish language skills, uh, fluent in Spanish, um, became important for the political asylum context. I had been in the embassy uh, almost every single day and got to know Julian very well and in 2015 we got together. You started a relationship? Yeah, I mean we fell in love and I, you know, I, this is a person that I've, I knew well by then, the person I know the most in this world. And he's extraordinary. He's generous and he's very tender and loving. On the computer, yeah? On my phone. On your phone? Yes. Yeah, you like to watch that. On my cameras. On your cameras? Yes. <laughs> Forming a family was a deliberate decision to see to kind of break down those walls around him and see life, imagine a life beyond that prison. And so while for many people it would seem insane to start a family in that context, for us it was the same thing to do. It was what keeps things real. And it does. It, it grounds. It grounds me. And when Julian sees the children, it gives him a lot of peace and nurturing and support. And that's good. And they're very happy children. In the bag. In the bag. Died. I think we're both traumatized by what's happened over over the last few years. Actually, I compare it to being in a 
being in a war zone. Um, constant, relentless attacks, you know, you're, uh, that there are operations underway and it's not some crazed conspiracy theory, it's uh, part of the reality of the context in which everything to do with uh, Julian um, exists. And just like in war, um, people fall in love and decide to live their lives in an act of rebel rebellion, I think. Falling in love is kind of an act of rebellion in, in a context where um, there's a lot of uh, attempts to destroy your life and your your reason for for doing what you're doing. This is the younger one, Max, with the cat. And uh, yeah, that's a little one. There's a big little one. That's a big one, kind of the same same picture. They're quite similar looking when you look at them like that. And uh, the big one has the, the older one has, is actually very much like Julian. He looks a lot like Julian, the, especially around the eyes, the kind of the um, eyebrows and the, the gaze is very much Julian's. The little one looks more like me, and he has Julian's ears and Julian's size, because he's very big. Um, and he looks like his brother, but of the two of them, the older one is very Julian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've seen him in, in prison, and it's, uh, I'm struggling to think of how to explain it, why he's there, and so on. You also don't want to you know you you want them to feel a positive feeling about going there as well, so kind of it's a bit of a charade. I don't think people understand the ex extreme situation uh and pressure that that we've been under because because Julian is a public figure, because everything about him is newsworthy. Anything can be used against him and has been used against him. And so this was a real dilemma about having a relationship in these circumstances means you try to insulate it and protect it as fiercely as you can. And that's what I've done, because that's kind of a, a haven, an oasis from the crazy context. I knew there was some spying going on um, when I found out that that my baby was targeted. There's a guard actually went up to me and told me that they were trying to steal the DNA. Um, I realized that I couldn't really protect my family. Even if I took all these steps, you know, more steps than most people, to, uh, to try to preserve our privacy and our security and Julian's safety, ultimately, um, in a way, it was beyond my control. And that was very difficult to realize. I understood that the powers that were um, against Julian were ruthless and had no, there were no bounds to it because there's a lawlessness around it and 
you know, they were after, I had baby's DNA, but what else, you know, what else are they after? And that's partly why I feel now that I have to, I have to do this because I've taken so many steps for so many years and I feel like Julian's life might be coming to an end. It's been 10 years, nine years, no, 10 years of breaking someone down, of trying to destroy his life. And it's a well-known pattern, you know, whistleblowers, people who expose the powerful, they destroy them. And we know this when this happens. And somehow everyone has failed Julian. They've all failed Julian. They've taken every negative angle they have been able to. You can do that to anyone. You can destroy anyone like that. You just need to start overanalyzing them. <sighs> Sweetie.